uh, and share the first talk because Mikhail is busy submitting the grant. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good excuse. Okay, I'll I'll share the uh, schedule for the second session. I can do it for you if you want right now. Yeah, can sure. can you okay, or can you allow me to share? Oh, okay. So you do it. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Yes, I can. Okay, I think I will just uh, start by saying hello again. Um, and so far, everything's working very smoothly. I was admittedly a bit worried how this online conferencing, especially hosting one, will work, where you mm -hmm. can take the passenger seat. Um, and so far, it's been working pretty good. And uh, the first invited, first three by the talks were all uh, fascinating, and I'm sure. Um, those who attended not just learned something, but also uh, went away with interesting new ideas, how to research as various aspects of bilingualism from genes to behavior to theorizing about it and nutrition as well. Now, in this second session, which is just hour and a half long, um, we will have four shorter presentations by um, young members of our lab in Moscow. Um, as I said at the beginning of um, today, uh, we have a small but rapidly growing group of people who are pursuing bilingualism in uh, various aspects of bilingualism in their research. And so there will be four talks, uh, 20 minutes each, and uh, um, I suggest uh, we uh, use the following protocol, so about 15 minutes of presentation followed by about five minutes of questions. As before, please raise your hand at the end of the talk when we open up for questions or um, post your questions in the chat. So the first uh, talk will be by um, our PhD student, Federico Gallo, who was particularly affected um, by the current situation as he hasn't, he's a PhD student in Moscow and he hasn't been back to Moscow for what, about seven months or something like that? Because um, he was uh, in Sweden on an internship and then had to go back to Italy, uh, to, back home to Italy instead of going to Moscow. So uh, we hope he'll be able to come back to Moscow where he belongs sometime soon. Um, so uh, Federico is a third year PhD student, just starting his third year, and he will uh, talk to us about individual differences in bilingual experience and how they modulate bilingualism's effect on executive control performance in neural substrate. It's all yours, Fede. Okay, I'll share my screen. Uh, Bea, I do not have rights to share my screen. Can you make me a co-host so I can? I think it's because I disconnected for a second. Yep, same here. They are? Anybody can hear me? I can hear you fine, Fede. Thank you. Just a second. Okay. Uh, <coughs> it's because it's Misha who is the host. So uh, one second that I will. Maybe you first have to stop sharing yours. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, so you can share your screen, I think, now. Uh, yes, I think I can. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Yep, working well. Good. Okay. So, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Federico Gallo, and I am a part of the CCCP research group, 
the one organizing this wonderful conference. And today we'll talk about the role of individual differences in the bilingual experience in modulating the executive control network and executive control performance. So let's start with a bit of background. You might know that putative benefits associated with bilingualism on cognition range from enhancements in executive control or executive function, whatever you want to call it. I will use the term executive control in this talk to neuroprotection during the healthy and pathological aging process. And the rationale behind uh, these effects would lie in the sustained effort that bilinguals have to face when they, whenever they communicate. So to communicate successfully, bilinguals have to avoid interference from the non-selected language and to use mechanisms of response selection to instead select the one that they intend to use and occasionally they have to switch between their two languages and to do this uh, bilinguals rely on a, a cognitive device named language control and this device is underpinned by a neural network that overlaps with the domain general executive network so by means of this continuous training in facing the sustained effort bilinguals would develop uh, beneficial effects for their domain general executive control both uh, at the behavioral level and at the neural level by means of neuroplasticity or neuroplastic changes. Anyways, uh, considerable variability has emerged in bilingual research uh, in regards with, uh, to regards, uh, with regards to the replicability of these effects. And this variability has been recently ascribed to a common practice of bilingual research, that is to reduce the spectrum of bilingualism to a dichotomous variable, so to perform group comparisons between bilinguals and monolinguals. And uh, we are, uh, we all are bilinguals here, or most of us are, uh, and we can testify that we are bilinguals to different extents. So some of us uh, use their second language a lot and very well, and some of us use it less and maybe with uh, less proficiency. So this dichotomization might conceal the role of individual differences in bilingual experience in modulating the neuroplastic and cognitive changes that bilingualism induces. So here to tackle this issue, we operationalize what we call uh, bilingual experience factors in a continuous way. And we investigated the effect of individual differences in these uh, uh, factors on the executive control performance and neural substrate. Our sample was made of uh, 22 Russian English bilingual young adults, and they were matched for education, socioeconomic status, and general intelligence, which are factors known to uh, affect uh, executive control. So we wanted to rule out any potential confound. Instead, our uh, sample, our subjects, uh, were diverse in the level of uh, these bilingual experience factors, which in our study were second language age of acquisition, so the age at which uh, somebody starts learning their second language, second language exposure, or the um, uh, amount of time proportionally that they spend using their second language, and finally second language proficiency, or uh, uh, the, uh, the extent to which they know a second language, let's say. Age of acquisition and exposure was, were uh, self-assessed via questionnaire, and instead proficiency was objectively assessed with a translation task from English to Russian. Let's move on to the methods of our study. In our behavioral analysis, our research question was to investigate the effect of bilingual experience factors, differences on the executive control performance. So to do this, we deployed a flanker task, which is a benchmark in executive control assessment, uh, a task that focuses on inhibitory control. And we carried out reaction time analysis on flanker task data. Here on the right, I don't know if you can see my, my pointer. My, I don't see it. OK, now yeah, I do. We see it. Yeah. Yes, we can. OK, thank you. So here on the right, you see how the flanker works. And uh, uh, you. Uh, as the participant are required to detect the direction of a central arrow, a target arrow, that is flanked by four additional arrows, two per side. 
you have three different conditions in uh, the flanker task. The first of all, you have the congruent condition, in which flankers and target point to the same direction. So this condition typically facilitates your performance and lowers your reaction times. Then you have the incongruent condition, which instead is the one that elicits or requires inhibitory control, where the target and uh, the flankers point to uh, conflicting direction, to, to opposite directions. So here, the participant has to override the prepotent incorrect response. That comes from the fact that uh, uh, flankers uh, outnumber uh, the target. So you have to uh, avoid this interference from the flankers and instead focus on the central arrow. This condition makes the task more difficult and typically increases uh, response times. And finally, you have a neutral co uh, control condition in which you don't have flanker arrows, but uh, only uh, dashes surrounding your target. So typically, uh, the flanker task is measured using uh, uh, the so-called conflict effect. So this effect is calculated as the difference uh, between the average reaction times in the congruent condition and the average reaction times in the incongruent condition, somehow a measure of the cost of inhibitory control for our mind and brain. And, uh, here, nonetheless, we could not uh, refer to averages because we decided to uh, adopt a linear mixed effects approach to perform a trial by trial analysis in order to increase the number of our data points. So using single trial reaction times, we did not have uh, uh, any average to use. So to incorporate a conflict effect in our analysis, we decided any time we focused on a predictor of interest to insert an interaction term for uh, trial type, for task condition. In this way, we, want, we wanted to be sure that the effects that uh, we observed were differentially affecting incongruent and congruent trials. Indeed, if you find an effect that is affecting these two at the same way, in the same way, you are witnessing a processing speed effect more than an inhibitory control effect. And that's why we always wanted the effect to be differential for congruent and incongruent trials. Moving on to our neuroimaging analysis, the research question was to investigate the effect of differences in bilingual experience factors, this time on the executive control network, so on the neural substrate. And to do this, we uh, extracted gray matter volumes from regions of interest part of the language control executive control network. The regions of interest were all bilateral, were the anterior cingulate cortex, the caudate nucleus, the prefrontal cortex, and the inferior parietal lobe. We decided to use an, sorry, an atlas-based approach, and this was done uh, to increase the uh, replicability of our results. Indeed, as I've said before, uh, bilingualism uh, is a field where uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, difficulties to replicate uh, findings and there is inconsistency. And so we used uh, this atlas-based approach because our regions of interest were predefined on a neurological atlas and everybody uh, can be able to uh, reproduce our results using the same exact boundaries for regions of interest uh, as the ones we adopted here. Let's now... Uh, report the results of our study starting from the behavioral assessment that showed that higher levels of second language proficiency predicted lower reaction times on the flanker and thus, and thus uh, better executive performance. And this happened differentially for the incongruent and congruent condition. You might not be able to appreciate it here in this tiny picture, but actually the slopes of these two lines are different and the incongruent one is steeper. So the effect is actually affecting uh, the incongruent condition more, as we expect. So this tells us that bilingualism uh, fosters uh, uh, executive control at the behavioral level. And this is somehow well known in the literature, but once again, there are a lot of inconsistencies about this. Especially, you find, we find inconsistencies when we refer to behavioral only studies. And that's why we wanted to insert a neuroimaging component and our neuroimaging analysis reported significant results for the bilateral anterior cingulate cortex and also approached significance 
for the bilateral prefrontal cortex. And what emerged in these areas was that uh, was a, co uh, a cross interaction between proficiency and exposure in predicting gray matter volumes. In particular, higher levels of proficiency were associated with uh, increases in gray matter volumes only at low levels of exposure. And vice versa, higher levels of exposure were associated with increases in gray matter volumes only at low levels of proficiency. So to illustrate what, uh, and sorry, when both of the predators reach high values, actually a decreasing trend in gray matter volumes emerge. So I have a graph here that uh, we can use to uh, explain these results and visualize these results. Focus first on the red line, uh, symbolizing a low uh, second language exposure. So when proficiency increases, you can see that gray matter volumes increase too, in this case. And then when you reach moderate exposure, now proficiency suddenly doesn't have any effect on uh, gray matter volumes. And finally, when we reach high enough level of exposure and high levels of proficiency, you observe this decreasing trend. So even in the context of a cross-sectional analysis like this, our results might somehow suggest a sort of trajectory for uh, bilingualism-induced neuroplastic changes. So somehow we are here. OK, my mouse appeared again. We are here. So we are learning our second language. We are at the very first stages. And uh, while we learn and progress in our experience, we can see that gray matter volumes increasing. And then we reach and touch a sort of plateau stage where differences in proficiency do not predict differences in gray matter volumes. And finally, we reach this very high level of experience and our gray matter uh, volume changes start to go back to normality and reach uh, almost uh, pre-bilingualism stages. So let's set aside this for a moment and we will discuss it in a minute. But first I want to present you the results of the last analysis we ran. This analysis combined neuroimaging and uh, behavioral data to investigate a modulation effect. So you might be aware of a very well-known relationship in uh, neurosciences that is the so-called structural brain behavior relationship. And this relationship for a given cognitive ability, let's say uh, executive control in our case, predicts that higher levels of uh, gray matter volumes uh, in areas associated with, it, uh, with this ability will predict better performance in this ability. So higher gray matter volumes, better performance, in our case, uh, on the flanker task. We wanted to investigate if bilingual experience somehow modulated this well-known relationship. And in order to do this, first of all, we computed a bilingual index that took into account all three of our uh, bilingual experience factors. And that's to avoid the risk of overfitting uh, related to uh, testing a model with five continuous predictors like uh, ours was before this index. And also to make our results easier to interpret and graphically plot, like, for example, interactions. So our analysis, our modulation analysis, uh, showed uh, significant effects in the bilateral coded nucleus and also in the left prefrontal cortex. In particular, what happened was, uh, let's focus first looking at the graph on the low and moderate bilingual index. Uh, so low and moderate bilingual experience levels. You can see that here, the, rela the relationship we expect is actually present. So we increase our, for differences that, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, for higher levels of gray matter volumes, we witness uh, uh, improvement of performance and reduction of reaction times. Same happens here for the moderate bilingual index level. Instead, the striking result is the one regarding high bilingual index. So these are very high uh, expert bilinguals, and you can observe that the line is flat. So differences in gray matter volumes did not predict differences in uh, reaction times or in executive performance. Not only this, these category of people, so high level bilingual index people, are the best you can witness here. Uh, you can see here, these are the best uh, uh, performing people because they have the lowest reaction time. And once again, this was differentially affecting incongruent trials of the flanker task. So now let's set this aside for a second and discuss the 
results of the neuroimaging only data to lead to a complete discussion on the modulation analysis. So we have said that our data somehow suggests, our results somehow suggest that the bilingualism induced neuroplastic benefit may hit a plateau stage at a certain stage of bilingual experience and eventually go back to normality, to the pre-bilingualism uh, stage. This is actually theorized by a recent model that is called the dynamic restructuring model uh, from Pliatsikas. And this model for cortical structures related to language control, as in our case, the anterior cingulate and prefrontal cortices, predicts volumetric increases in the early stages of second language acquisition. So when we are starting learning a second language, these increases would reflect the increased effort due to language control that we have to face because we come across language control needs for the first time in our life because we are now starting learning a second language. And so we have to accommodate for this extra effort. And we do this by increasing the uh, volume of our neural structures relating to executive and language control. These increases are then subsequently expected to plateau and disappear when language control becomes less effortful due to exp increasing experience, increasing exposure and thus proficiency. So we tune our neural systems better and we do not need this extra quantity anymore because now we have enough quality. So somehow this model predicts a sort of structure to function shift. And do we have any sign of this in our data? Uh, indeed we have in the modulation analysis, if you remember, that uh, suggests that expert bilinguals are able to optimize their performance independently of volumetric differences in their executive network. And this might be due to the enhanced efficiency and flexibility of these networks that they develop through extensive training, daily training. In fact, the literature shows that uh, high proficient bilinguals make a more efficient use of their executive network. For example, they have been shown to activate this network to a lesser extent than monolinguals, while at the same time outperforming these monolinguals on executive tasks, and also to activate different neural pathways during executive task performance than monolinguals. In turn, these enhanced efficiency and flexibility are of the executive network of bilinguals are thought to be at the basis for the neuroprotective effects observed during the aging process in bilinguals. And this neuroprotective effect would be mediated or would happen through uh, a mechanism named cognitive reserve. Cognitive reserve is defined as the discrepancy between the observed and the expected cognitive impairment given the level of neuropathology of the individual. In other words, cognitive reserve is the ability to compensate for neural damage while maintaining optimal and thus maintain optimal performance. So once again, let's go back to our modulation analysis here. Uh, it's true that this is a cross-sectional analysis once again, but uh, and on young subjects, but let's try to uh, transpose this in the context of senescence, of aging. And let's focus on the green line once again and start from the right side of the graph and going uh, left, uh, leftwards uh, across the, the, the line. If this was uh, uh, a senior subject, you can say that somehow this could be uh, sev more severe levels of uh, brain atrophy while we move to the left. So, uh, somehow the senior subject would experience or the senior subjects in a cross-sectional analysis would, would have different levels of atrophy. But you can see that if they were uh, high enough, uh, uh, highly enough uh, bilingual uh, experts or they had uh, high enough levels of bilingual experience module, uh, indicated here by this bilingual index, they would indeed maintain their performance to the same level. So it can be uh, weird to hear me talking about cognitive reserve in the context of a, a study uh, carried out on young subjects. But indeed the literature has shown, the literature of, cognitive, of uh, cognitive research has shown that cognitive research starts developing in very early life stages and it has been observed in uh, young courts too. And so this might somehow constitute the basis of uh, that neuroprotective mechanism that we uh, end up observing in late life stages in bilinguals. So that was all for my talk. I'm
I hope it was clear and I thank you for listening to me. I'll stop my screen share. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Fede. We have some questions already from Sohar Aviatar. Aviatar sorry. Do you connect these findings to Hernandez's finding where proficient uh, bilinguals had thinner cortex? Very nice talk. Thank you for the compliments. And while I have to say that I was rehearsing this during Arturo's very interesting talk, so I was hard listening because I have to be honest. Uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm uh, aware of this study. And do you refer to uh, studies in which bil senior bilinguals uh, have uh, comparable um, degrees of uh, symptoms, but at the same time have worse uh, neural uh, integrity? No, he showed us that he showed us a study of children where he had uh, older children who were um, who who were um, uh, bit more proficient bilinguals, and they had um, thinner courtesy. Oh, so, that... were, so the more bilingual they were, the bit, and they had a thinner cortex than the younger um, children. Yeah, and that so, can. Um, but I, I was. Start to, so, so essentially, it's it's non intuitive, right? Because the because the idea yes. is supposedly if you're if you're doing something better, you should have more brain doing it. But it, it also goes the other way. The be, the more expert you are, the less brain you need to do it. So yes, somehow right? this is counterintuitive because also me when I started doing this, it's it felt strange. And then this by this uh, model came and it opened my eyes somehow. So uh, uh, this can also be linked to previous talks today that uh, uh, I don't remember who was that uh, uh, hinted to the fact that I, th I think it was uh, Barbara that hinted to the fact that uh, uh, interpreters, which are uh, somehow super bilinguals, let's say simultaneous interpreters, they do not show these uh, uh, gray matter uh, increases as uh, learning bilinguals. Uh, so this exactly can be in all these three categories, the same effect, just on different scales. So very proficient uh, uh, children, uh, let's say they have been bilinguals all their lives, so they might not even need this uh, uh, extra accommodation effort uh, uh, or even, or they might need it only in very early life stages and then uh, speed up this process. So of okay. reverting back to normality. So this might be related to uh, the findings from Arturo you mentioned, and also from the findings from Piazzica's group on uh, interpreters, indeed. Uh, guys, I know that we're um, trying to stay on schedule, but what I what I want to suggest is let's 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 hear the questions because I'd rather push it back a little bit by 10, 15 minutes, even if, if it has to be, because we have a couple of excellent questions, and Arturo wanted to comment as well. So, um, uh, Bea, do you want to continue sharing this or I can quickly run through these? I'm, I'm fine if I can, I can just uh, read the question that Hamut al Kainer and then allow Ar Arturo to answer. To exactly, us. yeah, let's, let's do that. So can you yeah, read Hamut al's question and then let's move on to Arturo's comments, comment? Because I think it's nice to go through the discussion. Hamut al uh, is saying, interesting talk and very nice findings. Are these findings demonstrating increased volume while learning with a decreased volume when proficiency is obtained, similar to other types of learning? So I'm, once again, I'm not an expert in learning uh, neuroscience, neurosciences of learning, but uh, I mean, I've, uh, I'm aware of some studies in, uh, uh, regarding bilinguals that uh, show, uh, and I believe again, Barbara mentioned these studies that uh, showed increases in uh, gray matter volumes during the, I, I believe she talked about DTI, so white matter uh, integrity and connections but increases during second language uh, uh, learning, intensive learning that then com uh, come back to, uh, let's say a normal status. So ultra rapid neuroplastic changes. And uh, I have to say that I am not uh, aware of uh, 
the literature on general uh, domain learning and uh, neuroplasticity. It might as well be that uh, uh, there are other cognitive abilities that uh, when implemented in a, to a very high level of learned uh, produce this kind of findings. If anyone is familiar with this, uh, please jump in and contribute because uh, I'm not very, very experienced in this field. So um, should I now yeah, chime on. in there? Yeah, yeah, go on. So there is a, there is a, I put it in the chat. There's um, mm -hmm. there's a expansion and renormalization of the human brain structure, structure during skill acquisition. This is this idea from Wenger uh, that we actually have been in our papers sort of refer, actually I think more in our grant proposals and our papers referring to, right? This general effect of, you know, very early stages of training sort of look one way and then as training improves, right? As you reach sort of this plateau, it looks it looks kind of like you know so there's an increase in brain structure then there's this kind of plateau and then there's a decrease right as expertise improves so um, in fact there is some general literature on skill acquisition and i always i mean from a perspective our, of our lab and the way sort of we think about things we're always wondering why the bilingual literature sort of exists on its own without referring to the skill acquisition literature and vice versa, why the skill acquisition literature exists on its own and doesn't refer to the bilingualism literature because the questions and the sort of dynamics and the models are very, very similar, right? Just, just one is a domain of learning the second language. The other one is a domain of learning a new skill, but some of those mechanisms are overlapping. So there is a literature on that. I guess my question was, and, I, and this is sort of the one that I always kind of um, fall into is, you know, what is the role, I mean, in our lab, we've taken a really pretty strong interest in what we call age of acquisition to get out of the critical period and the sensitive period literature, but just the effect of when the skill is first acquired, right? And we know that that's confounded with the amount of experience, but I always wonder, you know, most of the models and the, the dynamic restructuring model is really sort of a model of an adult learner so in your data, is this an adult learner, an adolescent learner, a child learner? Are, are those things sort of taken into account? I was just curious about Yeah, that. these are uh, young adults, university students. So they are aged uh, uh, like uh, the average age is around 22, I believe. And uh, uh, to comment on, on, to answer your point, uh, if, uh, um, we actually didn't find any effect of age of acquisition. Um, and we carried out, uh, to be non-biased, we carried out also uh, backwards automatized uh, uh, stepwise selection models. And age of acquisition was uh, never included in the models. Uh, but age of acquisition, nonetheless, maybe because the variance is somehow included or uh, related to the variance of uh, the amount of exposure, as you pointed out. But uh, age of acquisition, uh, was part of the bilingual index anyway but uh, it uh, it looks like uh, the variance in bilingual index is also uh, driven mostly by exposure and proficiency so it might be because we didn't have enough variability in our age of acquisition because it was self-reported some people were not recalling perfectly uh, uh, when they started learning english or maybe because we had to focus on uh, uh, ultimate uh, uh, good attainment of uh, in the English more than uh, when they started learning because most people started learning at school but then they abandoned it and then they came back. So I can tell you that the age range, the, the range for age of acquisition were four to, was 4 to 19. Once again, the small sample size might be also a problem because with maybe with neuroimaging data, it, 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 it is a commonly published uh, maybe uh, uh, sample size but uh, behavioral data only might uh, not be enough and we try to overcome this issue with uh, the trial by trial uh, mixed model analysis but it might be for different reasons but uh, I have to say that we did not find uh, any effect of age acquisition. Hmm. I, I, I mean that's it and again I, I our data s fit in with what you found the age of acquisition effect is it is confounded with exposure and proficiency and it's 
I've been trying to wrap my mind about how you can piece those apart, but I, I, we have found similar things. In fact, one paper we just recently uh, published in Human Brain Mapping on Age of Acquisition, we had to do it by groups because when we ran it as a regret, and that was, you know, 200 and something structures, of, you know, 200 and something bilinguals. We could not get differences when we did it as a regression. We had to do it as groups. We could not figure out why when we, you know, regressed out proficiency. So, I, yeah, there's this very weird dynamic going between exposure and age of acquisition that we, I still, I keep telling people I want to see what that is. And I, I don't know what it is. But anyway, it's similar findings. Yeah, age of acquisition seems to be flaky. It's not yeah. always there. Not easy to find. Yes. All right, guys, there is a lively discussion going on. I'm very happy to see that in, in the chat um, um, between se several people uh, regarding Dragonsky study and, um, and, and similar data. So let's wrap up here with your permission. Um, but I really appreciate that we give our PhD students our, and our uh, younger researchers very unique opportunity, longer time to use up this very unique opportunity of getting feedback from major players in the field. And I, I, I treasure that greatly, much more than, you know, keeping the schedule, which is usually what I, what I would do. 